Hey everyone, Muneeb here. I'm the co-creator of Stacks, which is a Bitcoin L2. Uh, I'm really excited to be speaking to this audience. Uh, I was recently in Korea. I had a great time at the Korea Blockchain Week. And I'm looking forward to coming again uh, early next year, I think. So today uh, in my talk, I'm going to do two things. Uh, the first thing will be I'll give a overview of Bitcoin L2s. These are the layer twos for Bitcoin, which is a emerging area. It's a very exciting area, and I'd love to kind of like tell tell you more about it. And the second thing is specifically more about Stacks. Stacks has a major upgrade coming early next year called Stacks Nakamoto, and I'm going to describe some of the features with Stacks Nakamoto and walk people uh, through through some of them. All right. So let's dive in. I think the first thing uh, to cover is Bitcoin, the asset is really special. We all know that it is the biggest network. It's the largest crypto network out there. But Bitcoin is probably the only asset that is getting institutional adoption and traction as money. Uh, people are already viewing it as a hedge for inflation. Uh, people are already saving a lot of capital in, in, in BDC. And I think the reason is that Bitcoin is truly decentralized. It's truly grassroots. It is something that is durable. It's stable. Uh, it's been there for a long time. And people's confidence that it's going to be there in, in the coming decades is actually very, very high. So I, I view Bitcoin as freedom technology. I think there's no other network like that. It has $500 billion of capital. And I think there's a reason why Bitcoins are like remains the number one uh, crypto asset. And looking at sort of like the uh, the situation in the financial markets, I think there is a looming debt crisis. People are getting uh, concerned about inflation. And we've actually seen BDC decouple uh, from some of the other uh, traditional stocks and other assets. And people are realizing that Bitcoin is an inflation hedge. And if things go bad in, in traditional financial markets or if governments are printing too much money, they, there can be a capital flight to Bitcoin, uh, which, which is something that could be good for, for the growth of, uh, of the Bitcoin network. And people truly realizing the hard cap of 21 million of Bitcoin and how uh, it is a neutral network. Anyone, anyone can use it. And it's something that the, the Bitcoin network will remain open uh, to the world and anyone can come in and use it. It's truly, truly, truly like a beautiful thing. Uh, I've been in this industry for more than 10 years at this point, and I've seen a bunch of these cycles. I think of them as cycles of expansion. Uh, so we went to like first 1 million users, then 10 million users. And I think the, the, the coming years are likely going to be the expansion phase in which uh, the Bitcoin network sees like north of 100 million users or, or maybe, maybe even much more depending on uh, how it goes. So it's a very, very exciting time where the technology will go from sort of like early adopters and, and initial people uh, to much more mainstream. And I think Bitcoin is likely going to be the network and the asset that sort of like uh, leads the charge there and, and takes that uh, into the next, next stage of growth. So for Bitcoin, uh, one really interesting thing is that so far all the traction Bitcoin has seen is Bitcoin the asset on the Bitcoin layer one L1. And I think there is a huge opportunity if you view this as almost like a glacier that we are only seeing the tip of the glacier, which is Bitcoin the asset. And in terms of the applications that can be built with it, the Bitcoin L2s, these layer twos that can be there and the liquidity pools and lending and other types of applications that can be built, there's a huge BTC economy that is not visible right now, and that's actually underwater. And one of, one of the things Bitcoin L2s can truly do is unlock that and actually make, make that possible. And 2023 has been a very exciting year for Bitcoin so far. And one of the things we noticed was with ordinals, which are these L1 NFTs, we have seen a revival of building on Bitcoin. A lot of developers are coming, coming back to Bitcoin. A lot of people are realizing that Bitcoin is a place to build long lasting, durable applications. And we have seen ordinals take off. And, and, and as ordinals are taking off, we have seen a fee market emerge on the Bitcoin L1. If the gas fees go up a lot on the L1, then a natural thing that happens is that people want to go to L2s. They want to do cheaper fees. And I think uh, this was the year where the need for Bitcoin L2 was very clearly established because the fees actually went up by 25, 30X, or even 50X, depending on which month uh, that, that you're looking at. So I think at a high level, 
uh, the way to see this is there is no way to scale Bitcoin to a billion users just on the L1. We absolutely have to build Bitcoin L2s to take Bitcoin to a billion users. Like it's just not possible to do it on the L1. I think that's why these L2s are critical. And the second thing is the Bitcoin is actually very simple when, when it comes to the L1. So if you want to build sophisticated applications like decentralized exchanges or lending markets, any liquidity pools or, or any DeFi application really, I think you need L2s. This is not the case with Ethereum. Even, even on Ethereum, we're seeing that most of the users are now going to eat L2s where the gas fees are cheaper and, and, and people can actually use things uh, more easily. But on Bitcoin, the L2s are absolutely necessary for just some of this basic functionality. Like if you want to swap BTC to a stable coin in a decentralized way, uh, you would do that on an L2 because, because Bitcoin L1 does not have, have that functionality. So I think one um, takeaway uh, for everyone here should be that there's a need to mentally separate out BTC, the asset, and the rails that it runs on. Right now, people just think of Bitcoin as the L1, and that's where the asset lives, and that's what the rails are. And I think there can be hundreds of different types of rails, which are these L2s, and you can actually move BTC to an L2, use it there, and then bring it back. And these L2s can be a lot more experimental. Uh, they can have different features. Uh, they can they can explore sort of like different designs. And, and, and I think that sort of experimentation could be actually very helpful in growing the BTC economy because BTC would be the asset that would be getting used on all of these L2s and it will help grow the Bitcoin economy. So in my view, I think working on Bitcoin L2s is probably the most important thing uh, that any developer can do in, in, in Bitcoin right now. And by proxy, any developer can do in, in the entire crypto industry right now, given how, how big and important the Bitcoin asset is. So let's just quickly do a overview of what are the Bitcoin L2s right now. I think there are the four uh, big ones. These would be Lightning, Stacks, Rootstock, and Liquid. And there are some uh, newer technologies that are coming up on the Bitcoin L1 as well that can be that can be very helpful. So I think in general, people should think of Lightning as a low cost payment solution. It's a peer to peer network. It's not really designed for smart contracts or building you know, decentralized exchanges or, or lending pools and so on, but it's really meant for uh, quick uh, payment transactions, especially low value transactions where the amount is very low and you just quickly want to pay somebody and you don't want to pay uh, a lot of gas fees on the Bitcoin L1. Uh, then we have some uh, federated networks. So federated networks are where you sort of like trust a company or a, or a group of companies and uh, you can move BDC to that uh, federation and you can actually use it there. I think Liquid by Blockstream uh, is a prime example of that, where Blockstream plus some of their partners, they run the Liquid network. And when you're moving your BTC to Liquid, you're sort of like trusting uh, those, those uh, group of companies. And I think there are a bunch of uh, L1 technologies, which are super interesting. DLCs uh, uh, especially is, is a super interesting one where people should think of that as like slightly more advanced scripting on Bitcoin L1. And, and But they can enable pools of capital to accumulate on Bitcoin L1 and then interact with uh, smart contracts that are running on L2. And I think that's a very exciting thing because some people might want to leave their BDC on the L1, but still participate in the applications that are running on the L2s. Uh, and then in terms of, uh, of L2s that have full uh, VMs, meaning that developers can program anything that they can program on Ethereum or Solana, uh, there are two prime examples, and they would be Stacks and Rootstock. And, and I think Stacks is a, is a network that obviously as a co-creator I've been involved with, and it's an open source uh, uh, project. Uh, it's a very decentralized community. And I think I'm going to focus a little bit more on, on Stacks in the rest of this presentation and walk through uh, this really uh, big upgrade and a major upgrade called Nakamoto that is, that is, that is coming to Stacks. So Stacks V1, the first version of it, it went live in early 2021, and that has seen a bunch of success. I think right now, depending on what metric you use, but Stacks is sort of like the dominant, uh, bigger Bitcoin L2 
uh, out there. Just in terms of sort of like market cap, it trades at roughly like like a, a billion dollar market cap. I know it's a pretty famous project here here in Korea as well. Uh, but I think by other uh, measures, like for for example, by developer activity, uh, there's a research report that came out by Electric Capital, and over there, the stacks Bitcoin L2 uh, was ranked at project 38 throughout in the industry. And there aren't a lot of Bitcoin projects there. So I think the, the thing to understand is the Bitcoin L2 market might be early and it might be a little bit small, but Stacks is sort of like leading the charge in terms of like some of these traction numbers and attracting developers there, which is obviously very, very exciting for, uh, for me to see. And I think uh, there are now, it's a very decentralized ecosystem. And a lot of these uh, companies have gone out and done independent uh, capital raise and then all these companies are sort of building applications on the network, but also contributing uh, code uh, to, to the core uh, software as well. And, and my company, Trust Machine, is actually one of them. We are building Bitcoin applications. We have a Bitcoin wallet. We're we are looking at lending protocols. And, and some of our engineers, we contribute to the open source tax project. So for, for the next major upgrade, uh, I think there are basically three big things that are happening with the Nakamoto release. I think the current estimates are that it's likely going to go live sometime before the Bitcoin halving or, or, or close to the halving. And the three biggest upgrades are, number one, the current version of Stacks is actually pretty slow in the sense that it runs at Bitcoin speeds. So Bitcoin block comes every 10 to 30 minutes, and that's when this, this, the Stacks block comes as well. And in the next upgrade, you can actually do much faster blocks in between Bitcoin blocks, right? So the transaction times could be within five seconds, which is more like the UX a lot of people are used to on other networks like Ethereum, Ethereum L2s, and, and so on. So I think it would be a huge UX upgrade uh, for Bitcoin users where they can actually move around BTC on the L2, uh, but it's much faster and much, much cheaper because they are, they're paying less, less gas fees over there. The second big upgrade is that right now Stacks has a separate security budget. We know that Bitcoin has sort of like the biggest security budget out there. And uh, with the Nakamoto release, the security budget of the Stacks L2 uh, would effectively be the same for, uh, for Bitcoin. Like 100% of Bitcoin mining power would actually back the uh, reorging of any transactions on Stacks, which is a very, very nice property to have in terms of, uh, of an L2. Like if you do a transactions on the L L2, and it settles on Bitcoin, then for anyone to come in and change it, reorg it, remove it, they would actually have to attack Bitcoin L1 and actually make changes to Bitcoin L1. <clears throat> and the third and probably the biggest thing is really easy uh, a way to move BTC in and out of the L2. So there's a decentralized way of moving BTC in and out of the stacks L2, and it's called SBDC. And then we'll, we'll go into uh, some of that design over here, but that's a huge unlock. That's where a lot of BDC capital that's already sitting there can actually be deployed on the Stacks L2. And that's a, that's a, that's a very, very exciting thing. So some of these properties we, we already covered and the way to look at it that, you know, uh, you, can, you can think of some of these, these things are already live in the Stacks V1. And three of the really big things that we just covered, uh, they would be launched with Stacks Nakamoto. But I think as far as uh, sort of like developers and users go, the Nakamoto release should be think of like a major, major upgrade. I think it addresses some of the biggest sort of like UX pain points. People really wanted fast blocks and the developers in the ecosystem were able to figure out how to do it in a way uh, where there are cryptographic proofs of time passing in between Bitcoin blocks. And you can have really, really fast blocks that are, that are still settled on Bitcoin. And secondly, I think unlocking Bitcoin capital is the biggest thing here. For any Bitcoin L2, I think the main value prop is people can just use Bitcoin uh, there. Uh, they can take their BTC from the L1 and deploy it in different, uh, different contracts. And that way you're not like bootstrapping a new ecosystem. You're actually just unlocking existing capital, a $500 billion of capital that's already there. And you're just sort of like enabling it to be used in an L2. And that's a, that, 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 that's a very exciting thing. So some of the, the, the things that I'm looking forward to that I think even uh, in terms of exchanges, it will be great to see people uh, withdrawing their BTC over an L2. Right now, uh, people can do that on other networks like Ethereum, where when you're when you're withdrawing ETH, uh, sometimes you see a drop down that, hey, do you want to take it 
over this network, this L2 or a polygon or, or, or something else. And I think people might start seeing that on the Bitcoin side, that if you want to do a cheap, fast withdrawal, instead of doing it on the L1, you can actually do it on, on Stacks L2. And I think, I think, I think even basic functionality like that uh, could just upgrade Bitcoin UX uh, for people around the planet. And that's a, that, that I'm really looking forward to that. So in terms of how the SBTC uh, PEG works, PEG is basically the mechanism through which people can deposit and withdraw BTC from the L2. So there is a threshold uh, wallet that is maintained on the Bitcoin L1. And people who lock STX capital on the L2 are the decentralized group of signers who basically help uh, bring BTC back from the L2. So putting Bitcoin into the L2 is easy because Stacks already reads uh, Bitcoin state. So you just do a Bitcoin transaction and BTC shows up on the L2, like in your wallet. Like imagine if you're using the leather wallet that my company builds, uh, you just have BTC on the L1 and you click uh, sort of like uh, a button and uh, SBTC shows up on the Stacks L2. Right. So it's, 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 it's hopefully the UX of that is going to, going to be great. And the way path in is like fully decentralized and, and, and sort of like straightforward. And, and then on the, on the path back, Bitcoin L1 does not have the opcodes to verify that this capital is now coming from B2, from, from L2 back to the L1. So that's where the decentralized group of signers come in. People who have locked STX capital, they have real skin in the game. And, and, and these people are actually maintaining the threshold wallet and they sign off on your BDC, leaving the L2 and going, going back to the L1. So that's the trust assumption, uh, which, which is there in terms of a decentralized group of signers. In terms of the roadmap, uh, so this is uh, completely being built open source. Anyone can, and can view the code. Uh, on GitHub, people can join various working groups. There's so many independent entities that are sort of like contributing to this. And there are two big work streams. One is on the SPTC design. So the threshold wallet on Bitcoin L1, any changes that need to be made and how capital will move between L1 and L2. And then the Nakamoto consensus, the massive upgrade to stacks that introduces the new consensus algorithm, faster blocks, and, and the 100% Bitcoin uh, uh, hash power security and so on. So those are the, the two like bigger work streams. There are other work streams as well. For example, there is a VASM uh, work stream for making uh, some of the contracts running on Stacks L2 faster. Those are exciting as well, but I'm, I'm uh, focusing more on the two big uh, work streams on Nakamoto and SPDC. Over there uh, for SPDC, the developer release is already live. Uh, we just had a huge hackathon at an event in London where this was released and developers sort of love it. So if you're a developer, you want to play around with SBDC already, you should go look for the developer release of SBDC and play around with it. And for Nakamoto, uh, there are a series of test nets planned. So the first ones are more simple. For example, they just have a single miner and, and then the next one will have multiple miners and, and so on. So there are a series of test nets which are planned in November and uh, December of this year. And the idea is once we get to like, like the final test net, uh, people would have a lot more visibility on when exactly this is launching. In general, uh, the, the developers are aiming for launching before Bitcoin halving. And the reason for that is, I think that's the time for Bitcoin to shine. There will be a lot of attention on Bitcoin at that time. And I think um, getting attention from a lot of developers and users right before the Bitcoin halving for this major launch uh, could be could be something very exciting, and I think uh, SBDC uh, might have like some sort of like security uh, uh, sort of like constraints on it. In the first version, you don't want to deploy you know an insane amount of capital on day one on a new system, and I think the full version of SBDC might actually be a follow up launch uh, after after Nakamoto. Those are the current plans, but I think people should always go to GitHub to see what the what the latest updates are. So as I mentioned that it's a very decentralized ecosystem, there are tens of different uh, companies and entities that are contributing code, the people who are building new sorts of applications and that's that's actually really exciting. People are already trying to build 
uh, decentralized exchanges using 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 BTC. They're trying to build lending protocols. They're trying to build uh, perpetual swaps and, and and so on. And if you're a builder and you want want to come in and join this ecosystem, it's very open. I think GitHub would be the best uh, best place for you. So if people want to learn more, I would say go to stacks.co, uh, which sort of like aggregates a lot of this information. Uh, there are a bunch of white papers as well that these working groups produced. Uh, there is a white paper on the Stacks Nakamoto release. There's a white paper on the SPTC design. And I think those are the, the things to look forward to. So I think in general, my message to this audience would be that Bitcoin is a extremely important asset and network. Like it has been the number one network uh, since the beginning of our industry. And it still remains the number one asset. And I think Bitcoin L2s, uh, in my bias view, are probably the most important things we could be doing as an industry because it strengthens Bitcoin. It brings a lot more developers and a lot more applications to Bitcoin. Right now, if you look at Ethereum, Ethereum is something like $250 billion of, of, of capital and something like 50 to $60 billion worth of L2s are built around Ethereum. And I think if you look at look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin is around five hundred billion dollars of capital, and the entire sort of like market for Bitcoin L2s is one or two billion dollars. So I think there's a huge opportunity for developers to come in and try to build on Bitcoin L2s, try to mature Bitcoin L2s. And I think uh, we're doing a lot of work uh, with uh, Stacks Nakamoto, and we are uh, we are very excited. I, we think that once Stacks Nakamoto launches, it's going to show the world like uh, what capabilities a Bitcoin L2 can have and what benefits users and developers can have when they're using a really fast, really well-designed Bitcoin L2. So I'm really excited about, about this. Uh, looking forward to visiting uh, Korea uh, early next year as well. And I, I really love the, the Stacks community that's actually on the ground. And I'm looking forward to spending more time with them. Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me to speak here.